Good morning and welcome to this Media Freedom webinar. My name's Jenny Young and I'm the British Consul General here in Toronto. I'm really happy to be kicking off this webinar and working with Journalists for Human Rights to highlight the importance of media freedom. JHR's motto is mobilizing media, changing lives. And I could not agree with them more that media is a powerful force for positive change. Before we start today's discussion on South Sudan, I wanted to take a few moments to talk about our media freedom campaign. The UK launched the Media Freedom Campaign in November 2018 to shine a global spotlight on the issue and to increase the cost to those abusing media freedom and persecuting journalists. In July 2019, the UK and Canada co-hosted the Global Conference for Media Freedom in London. The conference was the first of its kind, bringing together journalists, ministers, jurists and representatives of civil society to shine a light on abuses of media freedom and to agree on how best to address these threats. The conference themes included national frameworks and legislation, building trust in media and media sustainability. We're, we're looking forward to the second global conference for media freedom, which is co-hosted by Canada and Botswana and that's on Monday, the 16th of November, so next week. Last year also saw the inauguration of the Media Freedom Coalition, a group of 37 like-minded countries who've made a commitment to improving media freedom at home and working together internationally. This coalition, of which the UK and Canada are founding members, has issued statements to mark World Press Freedom Day the impact of COVID-19 on media freedom and the anniversary of the London Conference. It has also spoken out on situations of concern around the world, including the charges against journalist Maria Ressa, who I know spoke at last year's media freedom event here in Toronto. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing threats to free and independent media around the world and those threats were already alarming. So it's really important that we oppose all attempts to use the pandemic to restrict press freedom, silence debate, abuse journalists, or spread misinformation. Today's discussion is going to focus on South Sudan. We have a really inspiring panel lined up, and I know we're all really looking forward to hearing their insights and to learning from them. And so I would now like to pass over to Rachel Pulfer, who is the Executive Director of Journalists for Human Rights. And Rachel is going to introduce our panelists and start the conversation. Over to you, Rachel. Great, thank you, Jenny. It's a real honor to be doing this today with you and with our esteemed panelists. And we are grateful for the UK government's ongoing leadership and support on the Media Freedoms Campaign. I look forward to an insightful and enlightening conversation on strategies to promote media freedoms and what we can all do to strengthen them. And we are doing this in part to direct attention to the Global Conference on Media Freedoms. Uh, at this conference, which is coming up on Monday, November 16th, uh, as Jenny mentioned, we will hear from a high level panel of media and legal experts, including Canada's own Erwin Kotler and Amal Clooney, on how the international community can best respond to direct threats to media freedoms. I like to call this kind of, that kind of work the emergency surgery of press freedom. How the international community should respond should, God forbid, we face another Adnan Khashoggi style killing of a journalist. How to intervene and support a journalist like Maria Ressa when she is convicted, as she was earlier this year, of cyber libel, a crime that didn't even exist when the offending article in question was published seven years ago. But for today, we are focusing on what I like to call the preventive medicine of strengthening media freedoms, building an enabling environment in which media freedoms can start to thrive. It's a grassroots, 
boots on the ground approach to media development, where trainers work side by each with journalists, government, and civil society in situ, helping strengthen journalists' ability to do their crucial oversight work, while also working to build a consensus of support for media freedoms across government and civil society. We'll be focusing this webinar on one of the clearest examples we have yet of the value of this preventive medicine approach, JHR's recent project with Global Affairs Canada Strengthened Media in South Sudan. This was a four-year intervention in the media sector of a country that at the time we started was at war. A country that, when we started back in 2015, was a UN plan of action country for the safety and security of journalists. JHR walked into a situation of open warfare between government and media. Journalists were dying in the line of duty at levels equivalent to those in Afghanistan. The year I first went to South Sudan in 2015, the president, Salva Kiir, was on record calling on people to shoot journalists for reporting against the state. The following day, a journalist named Peter Moy was shot and killed, leaving his newsroom in the capital city of Juba. In total, seven journalists lost their lives that year in the course of their work. JHR started the Strengthened Media Project in February 2016. In honesty, I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to make any real difference given the challenges. The project had been designed to encompass media development training on three fronts. We would be training media, yes, which is traditional media development work, but we also worked with both government and civil society. The end goal, to build that culture of support for media freedoms across all three sectors media, government, and civil society. Within four months of us starting, the country was back in conflict. A local trainee working with one of our international counterparts was shot and killed. Others on their staff were raped. We luckily were able to evacuate our team without security incident. And one of those teams happily is here with us today. But again, I was left wondering, what on earth of value are we going to be able to do in such an environment? The media authority, which was supposed to manage disputes between media and government, was instead acting as an arm of national security, shutting down the press union, kicking journalists out of the country. The country was literally at war with itself. It was then and remains the most dangerous place on earth for humanitarian workers. So the stakes were about as high as they could be. But we had two secret weapons in our JHR arsenal. One was an excellent project design developed initially by Robin Piero and Danny Glenwright at JHR in Toronto, refined by current JHR programs director, Zain al Mugrabi and local team leaders, Grant McDonald, Laura Bain, and Siobolela Mandela. The other was the extraordinary team of people that this organization attracts. And it is my very great honor to introduce three of those people to you today to share their perspectives on JHR's South Sudan program. The first, is South Sudanese sector leader and gender media. Currently, Irene is the founder of the Female Journalist Network, FJN, and acting principal for the Media Development Institute, which is the training wing of the Association for Media Development in South Sudan. We were privileged to both partner with Irene and work directly with her on her gender training in the country, and she led one of the most enjoyable workshops I ever attended, a program featuring Canadian journalist Sally Armstrong, in which we focused on working with women journalists in Juba exclusively in February 2018. The second is senior JHR trainer Mustafa Demboya. Mustafa was one of the first people to come on board the Strength of Media project. Prior to that, he was a William Seven Gordon Fisher JHR fellow at Massey College, and prior to that, he led the BBC Media Action Team in Sierra Leone, fighting the Ebola outbreak with facts and truth. And last, but by no means least, it is my great honor to introduce Peter Danola. For many in this audience, Peter needs no introduction. Peter is renowned for his long-term government service, laser-sharp political insights, and communication skills. Not as many people know, however, that Peter also spends a fair bit of time in the global south training journalists and government officials on how to work with one another with professionalism and respect. I asked Peter to go to South Sudan as an expert trainer with us on a volunteer basis in 2018. He's going to be sharing with you some of the insights he took from that experience when it comes to strengthening media freedoms. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Irene to share her perspective working with journalists, government and civil society in Juba on our program Strengthened Media in South Sudan. Irene, 
If you could share with us, please, what did JHR's project in South Sudan mean for journalists, civil society organizations, and the government? Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for inviting me for this meeting. I really am so happy to be here uh, to share my experience working with JHR, not only working with JHR, and working with the uh, media sector in South Sudan. Um, I was much involved in the JHR program. In 2017, uh, I cannot regret uh, my part of uh, I was involved in was gender. Irene, we're having trouble hearing you. Would it be possible to? And. Hello. Keep going, keep going, but maybe we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. There's some static. Maybe um, just just uh, 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 take a minute and, and let's, uh, we'll, we'll all make sure we're on mute and uh, then you can resume. Irene, maybe let's come back. Maybe let's come back to you, Irene, when the network has calmed down. I'll direct a question at Mustafa, uh, and then we'll come back to you and see if maybe the network has a better connection. Okay, thank you. My apologies. Okay, Mustafa, uh, you've been with us since the very beginning. Uh, can you tell us what you felt was the most striking change or changes that you saw through the time that JHR was working in South Sudan? Thank you very much, um, Rachel, for that. I hope my mics are working. Um, thank you, great. Thank you very much for that. And I was in, I first got into South Sudan. I should go, I should just go back to that in 2016. And this was in June, um, just before, a, a month before, sadly the country relapsed back into conflict. And when I arrived in South Sudan, as a journalist, as a media trainer, I had uh, big hopes, I had big um, ambitions to work with journalists to share experiences because I came from Sierra Leone, uh, a country that is quite, um, you know, has had its own fear uh, um, share of conflicts and, 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 and troubles. So I came into South Sudan uh, with that background about working with the media in, in Sierra Leone, in post-conflict Sierra Leone, which South Sudan was in 2016, June 2016, just before July. So I came into South Sudan with that experience to share those experiences. Sadly, by July of, the, of that year, the country um, relapsed back into conflict. Uh, which meant by then all of those dreams that I had we are kind of uh, seem to be dashing away. But then we are able to come back and continue the work that we do. And now I will speak about the work specifically. It was a difficult co um, um, context, a media context to work uh, because as you mentioned in your introduction, this was um, 2016, just immediately after the country had gone into war. Um, there were high tensions between journalists and the government and the security sector and everyone. So it was quite a challenging atmosphere for any uh, journalist to work. And I'm sure going back to the statistics, a lot of journalists um, have lost their lives in the line of their duties, you know, for just doing their work. A lot of them constantly by that time faced 
harassment, intimidation, and constantly being arrested and locked up um, for just um, practicing journalism. But then our intervention, once we started, we came back to South Sudan immediately, immediately um, 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 there was some sanity, that was all that restored. We got back into the country, started implementing the program that we had in South Sudan, which you mentioned it was a four year program. And our approach was pretty much a three, I would say a three prong approach. So we work with journalists, we work with the government, we also work with the civil society sector. And the reason why we use that approach, initially our focus was heavily on journalists, we work with journalists. But then as we um, continued engaging journal journalists, the stories that we constantly continue to get were the same. You know, they constantly get harassed, they constantly find it difficult to work. And the reason for that is the security sector in this is the military, the uh, secret service agency in South Sudan, which is called the national security. And uh, so there was always a constant tension between the journalists and these um, stakeholders. So what we started to do beyond providing training for journalists, we also started engaging civil society organizations. And the reason for that is to ensure that because their work with journalists complement um, 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 one another, the civil society are advocating to improve the living standard, to improve governance, to improve human rights. And that was at the thrust of what we do. And that was the thrust of what every community media also try to do. So what we, what we did was to create was to, was to create a platform was to ensure that they are not working against one another, but they are working, um, they work, they're working with one another. So we trained the journalists and our approach was to embed a, look, uh, a journalism trainer within local media outlets. And for journalists, we embed both international trainers and, um, uh, you know, uh, and a South Sudanese media trainer who understands the context, who has, who has lived it, who continue to live it and who continue to contribute um, to, the, um, to their country. So when we team up an international trainer and a community and uh, uh, you know, a national media trainer together to work with a media house, the international trainer brings in their own experts. They bring in their own experiences from outside and how things work from wherever they came from. I came from Sierra Leone. So I was able to share my experiences. I was able beyond training, it's more a mentorship. It's more a mentorship, peer mentorship program in, in most cases. So we're able to get journalists to produce human rights stories, to produce governance stories, to produce stories that question, that challenge power, that challenge authority, that also advocate you know, that also advocate at the same time for um, basic social services in a place uh, where the context for the provision of social services is quite limited. And there was a, a lot of impunity, sadly, from people at power at some point who thought they, they are not accountable to anyone. Our work was to show that, well, if you are in power, you are accountable to the people that you serve. And what we did with journalists was to empower the journalists with the with the skills that they need to ask these tough questions to do the stories and hold um, 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 powerful people um, accountable. That was one um, strand of the work that we do with journalists. And then beyond that, we also started working with, as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, we started working with the security sector because we also realized the security sector are relevant if we are able to get these journalists to use the skills that they've acquired in, in, the, in this type of environment where there's always um, um, tensions between the journalists and the, 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 the authorities. And I will speak more about, maybe I will speak more about how we got the security, how we got the security to listen and to work with the journalists. And uh, my colleague Irene is here, she was also part of most of this work. Uh, Irene could also, um, you know, contribute to this discussion. And, 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 you know, and one thing that is important, Rachel, is also that doing our work, because we are a Canadian funded program, we also ensured we had a good working relationship with the Canadian um, um, High Commission uh, in South Sudan. Alan Hamsin was the, you know, for the most part of our implementation was the, you know, was the Canadian um, ambassador to South Sudan. And he was quite instrumental in, 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 in some of the successes, some of the work that we were able to do, because we were able to get him to use his 
diplomatic privileges um, to work with the, you know, to engage the government agents and government authorities. And one of these was done in 2007, 2008, where we got Alan, Alan had a meeting with the media authority in South Sudan to discuss generally about media freedom, about press freedom, and why it is important to create a space to allow journalists to um, practice their skills, uh, you know, on behalf of the general populace. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mustafa. That's wonderful. Uh, I seem to recall talking with uh, you and Laura uh, when we were all in Juba at Logali House, and uh, you were describing how one of the things you found really interesting was that when you started, the journalists didn't want to, to question officials publicly on air because uh, of the potential repercussions of offending them uh, in public. Um, and that as, as the program got going, uh, we were able to normalize the practice of questioning officials on air and officials understood that they needed to come on air and uh, be held accountable in that way. Um, and uh, I, I thought that was a really interesting insight. Let's go back to Irene uh, and let's see if we can get a better connection now. Irene, could you please share for us your perspective on what this program, what the value of this program was uh, for journalists in South Sudan in particular? I think you're on mute, Irene. Try again, just hit the microphone. Okay, uh, Irene, we're gonna come back because now there seems to be a microphone problem. Um, I'm going to ask a question to Peter and then we'll, we'll try and come back to you. Um, uh, uh, and meanwhile, if you can just uh, uh, work with our tech people to make sure that your microphone is working. Um, okay, uh, Peter, uh, looking back on your experiences working in government, can you talk a little bit about the role that journalists play in a democracy and why that drew you to working with JHR? Right. Um... Well, first of all, thanks for including me in this. And uh, I just want to salute the work of the people um, that I met in South Sudan, uh, Mustafa, Juma, Laura, the whole group, which had done, in, there were about nine trainers when I was there from all over Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Sierra Leone. Uh, and the work they were doing was just phenomenal. Uh, and I could see it in real time. I went to different sessions where they were one, one training session for bloggers and, and freelance journalists. Uh, I was really pleased to be able to participate and to lead a session, a large session for uh, uh, women's uh, organizations um, that were, you know, women's NGOs with about a hundred women uh, from throughout from different regions of the country, uh, and it was really exciting. I mean, and and it really plays into to my approach. I'm not a journalist. I never even played one on television. I, I've worked with journalists all my career, uh, and primarily for public institutions for the government. Uh, and to me, the uh, the media, a free open media is a very, very useful thing for a government. It's a mirror that it holds up to society. It tells governments uh, what programs are working, what's not working, uh, what issues need attention, how people really feel. Uh, it tells, an accurate media, media tells people, an accurate media means an open, unconstrained media, uh, tells, tells government uh, what the daily lives of people are like. And I think there's, there's, it's, a, it's an invaluable tool for governments in terms of gauging uh, what they ought to be doing and what's working and what's not. In terms of, of South Sudan, and that was a message that I brought when I met uh, with the media authority, but you know, the work was already done by, uh, by Mustafa and Laura and Juma and others who had prepared the media authority 
uh, and had worked with the media authorities. So they, they had gone from being, as you said, hostile to the media and suspicious to being advocates for the media with the government. And the work that uh, Mustafa will talk about with the security uh, uh, apparatus uh, speaks to that because I know the media authority was a huge ally in that. So uh, a couple of points. One is uh, it's important for uh, government to understand the openness of media, but it's also important for media to, uh, for people, ordinary people to be able to access media, not just as consumers of media, but to understand how they can tell their stories through media. And that was why I was so pleased to lead that that um, session, that day long, a very, it was marathon, but it was worth it. A day long session with, with uh, uh, women's organizations from throughout the country. Uh, there was tremendous, uh, um, understandably, uh, people are intimidated by, uh, by cameras, by the media. They're suspicious, they're skeptical of being able to get their messages out. And uh, so we worked through that all day uh, with, uh, with uh, women who are super accomplished, super grassroots, um, uh, organizers and help them understand how rather than, than being intimidated by the media or by being intimidated by media technology, for example, uh, that uh, the role they could play was to make media relevant to the lives of other people by explaining uh, the work they were doing, why it was important. Listen, I've been in communications my entire career. I think that we tend to make things much more complicated than they need to be. Communications is really about uh, uh, sharing experiences, sharing thoughts. And the more we can make those relevant to ordinary people, uh, the more important it is. That's why I believe that, that one of the great eye openers and it's an aha moment for me, but it makes so much sense is that actually human rights reporting, journalism for human rights, isn't just about you know, exposing the latest scandal or uh, you know, speaking you know, fearlessly truth to power. It's really about telling people things that are true and important in their everyday lives and helping through telling those stories, get the changes they want. It's not always, you know, overthrowing a regime. In fact, it rarely is. Sometimes it's about getting garbage pickup in your, uh, in your community. And, you know, you guys live through experiences like that. Sometimes it's about, uh, you know, helping people, uh, you know, get places on bicycles. Sometimes it's about um, ensuring the cooking oil uh, prices uh, aren't gouged. And these are the real kind of, day-to-day -day impacts, of, those are human rights issues because they, they're, they affect people's ability to live uh, decent lives. And the more that, that we can encourage people to see that, the less of an insurmountable mountain this seems for a lot of people, uh, and the more kind of they can understand and, and experience what, what, what's happened in South Sudan and, and in Mali where I was uh, you know, just in March, this, this sense that, um, Actually, it's not insurmountable. It's not a huge mountain. You take it off, you know, one bite at a time, and you can use journalism as a means to improve the daily lives of people and to, and consequently, to really tangibly improve, improve people's human rights. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very well put, Peter. Thank you. Uh, we have Irene back with us. Um, so, uh, inshallah, uh, we'll make this work. Uh, and, uh, Irene, I'm wondering if you can segue off of Peter's comments to share uh, some of those, some of the stories that you saw the, coming out of the program and your perspective of what the value of the program was uh, for journalists in South Sudan, in particular for women and women journalists in South Sudan. I'm still not able to hear you, Irene. I don't know if you can try with headphones. Do you have headphones? Okay. Okay, while we figure out the tech piece with, while we figure out the tech piece with Irene, I'm just gonna share one story that I, I know uh, was part of the team of trainers that you worked with Mustafa and that was uh, working with Carolyn Thompson on uh, highlighting uh, the fact that there were certain schoolgirls in Juba who weren't getting access to funds to pay their school fees to go to school. Uh, to, to your theme, Peter, uh, this was not a confrontational story that uh, took truth to power and brought a regime down. 
but I'm wondering if maybe Mustafa, if you could share the basics of that story uh, whilst we hopefully get uh, a, a situation where Irene can actually be heard on the webinar. Thank you, Rachel, um, for that. I mean, as uh, Peter said earlier, human rights too is really about everyday people's experiences. And it's about the media uh, you know, being in a place to identify these issues and, and, and you know, uh, put, centralize them and ensure that they are not being swept under the rug. People, are, you know, people talk about them and then ask questions where, um, where we have to ask those questions. And this story is one of, is one of those issues. It's a story on um, you know, a project being supported by um, um, foreign governments, the UK and all the partners in South Sudan. And it's called Just Girls Education South Sudan Project. And the idea for this is to ensure that more girls are enrolled and retained in school because the disparity between boys and girls in schools enrollment in South Sudan is quite huge. And so it's more or less an, it's more like an affirmative action to ensure that um, girls have been given uh, stipends. Uh, girls have been given stipends that help them to stay in school. So the stipends pay for things like um, um, sanitary pads, help to pay for things like books and, and soap and you know just things that help girls to stay in school. So it's quite a very successful project um, um, in South Sudan. But then again, it was faced with serious challenges. There were um, um, issues with uh, between the money when it's given to the girls and then the school authorities. And somehow, somewhere, some girls will get, you know, um, get left out of this money. Apparently the money might go to somewhere else that it shouldn't supposed to go. And one of the journalists that we are uh, working with then, I was working with at, uh, the English publication in Juba, it's called the Juba Monitor, it's called Jale Richards. So Jale Richards worked with our colleague, um, Carol and Thompson uh, to do the story, to start speaking to these girls who were affected by this. And other journalists that we work with, um, um, you know, um, Charles K. Mark from, um, you know, um, Radio Bakita, and a couple of other journalists from the Catholic Radio Network, all of them, like, you know, um, collaboratively work on the story, prioritize these issues, speaking to these girls and, 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 you know, amplifying their voices and, you know, what it means to them missing out from the fund. And eventually the managers of the fund um, just the Girls Education South Sudan program, you know, pick up this issue and brought together all the relevant um, authorities, the Ministry of Education, the other partners that are implemented the project, and then start asking questions about what, you know, what's happening with the policy, what's wrong with the policy, why some girls have been left out. And eventually, I mean, if I could summarize the story, um, you know, based on this um, initial publications and, you know, sustain um, um, publication on this issue, eventually Eventually, the, the, the managers of the fund were able to trace the problem that, well, some of the girls actually don't get the money because some of the school authorities take the money. And some of, some of the girls don't get the money because um, some of the parents take the money. So at the end of the day, what happened is it's corruption. That's what it is. And it's corruption that actually was depriving uh, some of these girls um, access to education. So this story was told by the different um, journalists that we worked with, and eventually, the you know the 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 the, 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 front, the, the managers of the fund were able to figure this out, and they were able to and roll all those girls back into the scheme and then ensure that they put safeguards in, in place to ensure that something like this do not repeat. So that was quite, you know, on it's not a confrontation with the government. It's not a confrontation with anyone, but it's something that actually held, uh, journal, you know, national journalists, local journalists picked up, worked on it. We uh, provided the relevant skills, training, mentoring for them to do the story, but this, national media houses we are able to hold you know to hold people accountable for you know um, for corruption eventually and those girls who are missing out from school were able to be enrolled back to school region so this is an example of some of the work that we do and there's a couple of you know uh, just really um, 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 grassroots examples like that we are journalists from a community radio pick up a story on uh, on access to water supply in juba uh, in a particular community in juba they did this story and they were you know 
um, you know, the suppliers of the waters were hiking the prices, which was corruption. And this journalist, Charles, was able to pursue this issue and was able to speak to all the stakeholders, people who are not getting water, the water tankers that sell water in Juba, the, 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 the Ministry of Water and, uh, in, in Juba, and everyone who was involved. And he was able to get to the bottom of this issue to ensure that a community is able to get water. So on, 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 a, on, on, on a grassroots level, this is some of the work that the journalists that we work with uh, are able to accomplish. That's wonderful, uh, Mustafa. Thank you so much for sharing that. Irene was just there and now she's gone again. Um, so I'm gonna come, uh, I'm gonna ask you, Mustafa, if you, you'd, you'd alluded to some of the work that you did in particular with Laura Bain uh, and also with Peter on the security sector and the work with the media authority. We've mentioned the media authority, but we haven't really explained what the media authority is supposed to do um, and how that changed during the time we were in South Sudan. I'm wondering if you could explain that briefly and then hopefully we'll be able to get to hear from Irene after that. So the, the media authority is uh, it, 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 it set up, it's a statutory body in South Sudan set up by the, the parliament of South Sudan to serve as a self-regulatory mechanism for uh, journalism, in the, for journalism in the country, and their yeah, role is supposed to be uh, in between, um, the, you know, the consumers of news, the public, and the uh, and uh, and you know the the leaders and everyone who has any. Um, grievance with, with, with the media, but then, and they also, they also um, regulate the media and they do all this work. But then at some point there was serious tension between journalists and the media authority because journalists, journalists didn't trust the media authority. Journalists that we spoke to will accuse the media authority of siding with the security apparatus, with the government. So the media authority by then, you know, stand accused of being an, an extension of, of the security apparatus that the government, that, that the journalists fear so much. The journalists fear so much and because of the impact the security sector uh, had on the work of journalists because of the harassment, because of, um, you know, because of all of this. But then in, in something happened in, in, in 2017. In 2017, we, we saw this and we were looking for ways to work with this. And then it was Lover Bain, um, who is the, my colleague, Lover Bain, who was then the, you know, the journalism team leader in South Sudan. And she was really bent on ensuring that we were able to, bre you know, to, to bridge this gap between the journalists and the, the media authorities. And so what Laura Bain started doing was to engage. Uh, we started having meetings with the media authorities. And these meetings that we had with the media authorities um, culminated, like, you know, we escalated it to a regional conference in 2017. And the idea, we, the idea for this was to ensure that we brought the, the, the media authorities of South Sudan to Kenya and invited other, other, media, other media regulatory bodies from the East African region, from different countries. And the idea for this was to share best practices. So you know, it's it, to get the media authority from South Sudan to listen from other media councils across the region about how they do their work and about the importance of independence of the media council because you need to you need to earn the trust of journalists so they could um, comply with your regulations. So we had the conference in Nairobi in 2017, and it was quite a success, successful conference between different media. Uh, media um, um, regulatory bodies of the region, speaking primarily about media regulation in the, video, in the region, safety and security of journalists, and the role of media councils in ensuring that journalists are protected. At the end of that at the end of that conference, the media council of South Sudan, the media authority, went back to Juba, resolved to pick up their job and do their job properly. And, 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 and they Im immediately they went back, they started already implementing new um, 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 policies in ensuring that they serve as independent as they should be. And that also followed up by another engagement by, I mentioned the former ambassador of Canada in South Sudan, then Alan Amsin, who also continued with engagement with the media authority. With the media authority. And that also then moved on our engagement with the media authority continued because they said, okay, well, it's not just us. We also have the security. We also have the security agencies that we work with. So they also have to come on board. So what we did was then also, you know, Laura relentlessly continue to pursue this and ensure that we engage the, the South Sudan police services. We engage the, 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 you know, the SSPDF, which is the South Sudan People Defense Forces, which is the, the National Army. We also engage the, the national security agencies. So we had a huge 
um, World Media Freedom Roadmap Conference in Juba. And then once we got the Juba one, we escalated it to most of the states across South Sudan. And if you understand the geography and the logistics of that, it's a quite a very challenging thing to do in South Sudan in a place where most of the roads are dilapidated. You really can't drive on road because, not just because of insecurity, but also because of the roads are not just, um, you know, they are not, the boats are not proper, you can't use them. So we had to fly to different states, engage all the me in every state we go, we ensure we brought together journalists, media journalists, um, security agencies, government representatives in one room. The idea, the idea was for them to speak to one another because that didn't happen. And when those discussions started to happen, a lot of revelations came out. You know, I was in most of those discussions. And I remember one of the generals coming up to say, well, you know what? These journalists always think they are, we are the ones who have guns. The camera as they carry, we call some of them, when I see a journalist with a big camera, I look at it as a gun, as, as, a, as a weapon to me as well. So you have to be careful the way you, the way you approach me with your camera. So at, to me, that was a moment that uh, speaks volume about the distrust between the two. And most of it was just a misunderstanding between the journalists and the security. So once we started those discussions, we ended that those events with um, uh, memorandums of understanding between the between the media authority of South Sudan that committed then you know committed to continue to do this work. And one of the things that used to happen and how a big outcome, Irene could allude to this. Hopefully she gets a, a microphone on soon. Uh, one of the things that really came out of that that I am personally proud of was that for very long, the security agencies we are involved in regulating media. If a journalist publish or broadcast something that someone didn't like, the journalist would be arrested immediately, you know, directly by the media, by the security agencies. And the trouble with that sometimes there was no central command. It means every security agency could just go pick up a journalist and lock them up. And what happened then, the media, you know, after this engagement, which the security agencies were involved in, they agreed to allow the media authority to be the one to fully on regulate the media now. So if a journalist has any uh, a, a misunderstanding or anyone has any grievances against a journalist, instead of getting security to arrest the journalist, you report to the media authority it, because it's their job to go in between the journalist and, uh, and, 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 and members of the public generally. So I think in a whole, um, this is was our work with the media authority, with the government and that engagement continued. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Well, thank you, Mustafa. It's you who did that work, you and Laura uh, and Juma and your team and Irene. And I'm praying that we're gonna be able to hear from Irene. <laughs> um, uh, uh, my, my understanding, Irene, uh, is that as a result of, in part, as a result of the, this work that uh, Mustafa and Laura and the team and you did, uh, uh, no journalist has actually died in the course of their work in South Sudan since 2017. Is that correct? We still can't hear. Yes, oh, that is true. I'm here. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Go you on. You can hear me now? Yes, we can, loud okay, and clear. That's it. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, since 2017, no journalist has died in the line of duty. Uh, yes, and that was really a result of the engagement that JHR had uh, with all the organized forces, the army, the police, the national security, and all the ministers of information from all the 32 states of South Sudan. Yeah. So, and another thing that uh, Mustafa has not mentioned is that before uh, the engagement that JHR had with the national security and all the organizations, when we used to have any media event, we used to ask for security. But then uh, when organized by JHR in collaboration with media authority, uh, one of the resolution was that uh, from then onward, the media will not take 
security clearance from the national security. They will only require a letter of no. Of, what does it mean to the media in South Sudan? It means that we can now organize our event and bring in any speaker that we want and bring in any participant that we want to attend to attend our program. Because when we used to ask for security clearance, they could look through the program and see what they don't like, uh, what they don't like to address the public and what they would like, uh, who they would like to address the public. They could also see the list of participants, who are you inviting? And also, uh, you know, ask you to delete some participants who they, they are not comfortable with. So that, that was it when we used to ask for security clearance. But now that is no more. And we are happy about that. Uh, they used to come directly to their houses to arrest journalists. Uh, into or confiscate even newspapers. Uh, but now, uh, if they have any case uh, with a newspaper or with a journalist, they have to go through the media authority uh, to complain just like any other person. Because uh, security used to take uh, law into their hands to do all this. But now, at least, uh, there is a negotiation now through the media authority. Uh, that uh, the, the, the dialogue and also there was really misunderstanding in all the states of South Sudan by the ministers. As you know, in South Sudan, uh, the, the 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 government official uh, change every now was this uh, engagement with all the ministers. Uh, at least now they, they understand now the role of the media. They didn't know who a journalist was. They thought that a journalist has to be the mouthpiece of the government. They have to, you know, talk about the government programs and all that. So, but then uh, with the engagement, they were told that a journalist has an ethic that they have to follow. A journalist uh, is someone who is objective, who you know report exactly what they, they hear and we have independent media they didn't know because uh, you know our setting is really a very poor setting coping from Sudan where there was no independent media but now they came out because those days we only had the SPLA uh, radio it was only to speak and praise the F SPLM uh, during those days. But now we have become a country, we need an independent media, we need the media that is a watchdog, a media that can check the power and, uh, you know, and ask for accountability and all that. So the information uh, ministers were informed the role of the media. Now they are aware and now they, they can even facilitate the work of journalists when uh, we have got feedback, good feedback from uh, most of the state when journalists go, you find that even the Minister of, of Information gives them a facilitation in terms of letters to facilitate their work in the field. It used not to happen like that. Uh, uh, of course, I was also involved with uh, the training of uh, female journalists uh, and also involving uh, women from civil society. Uh, we also involved women from pal parliament the, through the parliamentary caucus. And uh, really the impact was very great because um, before uh, speak, to the media because they had uh, you know issues like they were fearing that they were going to be uh, you know uh, defamed the media was not correcting their work they were not going to report uh, exactly and because of also the political crisis that is going on in the country everyone fears that when they say something the government will come after them but then through our engagement, we told that, yes, look, the media is a professional. They know their work. 
And uh, for you, the women, to be known that you are doing your work, you need to speak like the same way the men are speaking using the media. You need to speak to the media. And you need to, to be available because some of time, sometimes they were hiding themselves. They really fear to talk to the media. We told them the media is a human being. You can talk to them and you can be hard. So um, uh, in 20, early last year, we had one of the women who attended our workshop in February. And after attending the workshop and we encouraged her to talk, she went to a constituency in Bor because ever since she was elected in 20, 2010, she never go back to her constituency because she was fearing how is she going to talk to people? How is she? Because, you know, our women, some of them were brought under ticket of women, women lists because the SPLM wanted at least 25% of women to come to the parliament. They were just selected. But then we empowered her that you can really go to your constituency and talk to people there and find out what are the challenges your people are facing because these are the people you are representing. So she went and spoke to her people and people were so happy. And when she came back, she called us in our office and she made a press conference in our office that uh, I met my people and these were the challenges. So this was published on uh, radio, I radio, and many of her colleagues, her colleagues from parliament, they were amazed, they were happy, they were, you know, inspired. And some of them started now going back to talk also to their people in their constituency. So these are some of the things that uh, we, we really encountered, which were really very encouraging. And uh, for the female journalists, many of them were having challenges uh, of lack of training, capacity building. They felt that they were marginalized. They felt that they were discriminated. But we, uh, through the, the training, uh, the, 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 the training program that JHR gave us to mentor journalists, female journalists in the media houses, uh, we managed to bring back uh, female journalists who were already discouraged from the field. Uh, we managed to attract uh, very many female journalists. And actually, uh, the formation of the female journalist network was as a result of the engagement that we made, we made through the JHR program. That brought a lot of female journalists together. So when we had uh, the meeting in 2018, we decided to form the Female Journalist Network so that even when JHR is not there, we could keep connecting using the network, uh, to connect female journalists to discuss their empowerment, their development. So this, the, now we have so many female journalists in the field that even people could not believe that that number of female journalists could be got in South Sudan. And really they are competing, they are very active, uh, they are very energetic, they are really encouraged because now they have this that is, you know, empowering them. And this, all this started with the, with the of course, it did mean that I was not also empowered uh, by JHR to be a trainer. I would have not had the chance to bring female journalists together and to encourage them to form this kind of network. That uh, is an, I, I thank you so much, Irene, for sharing that story. That is true leadership. And uh, uh, I, I, I am very, very thrilled to hear uh, the extent to which that network has been operating because I did not know that. Um, uh, but that is absolutely wonderful. Uh, I'm wondering whether uh, one of the things that is important to stress in this webinar is that we're, we're, we're at baseline here in South Sudan. Uh, in that we're not in a situation now where journalists are being killed anymore, but there are still plenty of challenges uh, that journalists face. 
do have to credit Elijah Auer, the, the head of the media authority, who has been a big part of ensuring uh, this uh, change uh, when it comes to journalists having more space to work in. But I'm wondering if Irene first and then Mustafa, if you could share your perspective of what, what now remains to be done, what's, what is now to be done with this momentum, with this uh, foundation that we now have. I mean. Yeah, I think we, we need more intervention because I think what GHR bring on board was trust. Because we in the media sector of South Sudan, we, we have the issue of trust, lack of trust, where uh, the national do not really trust themselves a lot. Uh, people who have been working together do not trust themselves. So when JHR came in, uh, they, they came with that, uh, you know, they proved to be trusted. And that is why the media authority opened up to engage with them. And that is why the Ministry of Information gave his support to, to work with JHR. I think uh, this kind of trust need to, you know, to develop. We need to build trust so that the government Feel at ease working with the independent media. And that is what is now lacking because uh, uh, currently JHR pro project has gone a bit down in South Sudan and uh, the engagement is not up to the way it used to be last year, uh, which really there is a break there. And I, I wish we could continue so that uh, we don't uh, the trust that we've started developing already with the government. Um, we need to develop capacity of the media authority to be able even to form uh, the missing uh, specialized committee. Because right now, the specialized committee, there are supposed to be eight specialized committee within the media authority that should be handling. Uh, the media complaints, uh, that should be handling the media issues. Because uh, when these specialized committee are not there, the journalists themselves will not trust the media authority. Because now uh, it is only the management aided by MD is the one doing almost everything. They are the legal committee, they are the committee, they are the appeal board, they are everything. But then uh, if there is any way we could develop that capacity for them to be able to form all the specialized committees, uh, who should work uh, within the media authority so that we avoid uh, complaints related to the media, going to the police, going to court, uh, going to to national security, because when national security find there is a gap, they will automatically come in. So we should avoid uh, leaving a gap uh, by forming all the specialized committee within uh, the media authority. Another thing, uh, of course, there has been complaint about the lack of uh, professionality, uh, professional journalism in South Sudan among the South Sudanese journalists of which JHR has worked very hard to ensure that uh, journalists in South Sudan are equipped with the skills to enable them to do their work professionally. There is need to keep these people who are trained within the media sector because uh, some of them now, because they, they feel that they are now well equipped, they are hijacked easily by, by, the, by the NGO world because uh, the media houses cannot sustain them. There is lack of sustainability uh, by the media houses to sustain the professional journalists that we have trained. Yeah. So meaning that if these professional journalists leave, then we, we shall start again from the scratch. But we have to again bring new people and train them, uh, which is really, you know, kind of, uh, it's not easy. So we need to develop the capacity of uh, media houses, the sustainability to sustain uh, the resource person that we have trained, and also to sustain their, I, I like, JHR also uh, did uh, 
uh, management training for media houses, marketing, right. how to manage the resources and all that, which was really very good. And if we could continue to do this kind of thing, because we have a number of media houses in South Sudan, that if they are able to manage their houses, I think the sustainability could not yes. be a question. But then we need to kind of continue developing this kind of process. Thank you so much, Irene. That's really helpful. I've actually been taking a few notes here um, as we start to lay out our strategy for our next phase in South Sudan. Um, and I'm wondering, mindful of time, if I could just segue to Peter uh, to speak from your perspective on why it's so important for governments, the British government, the Canadian government and others to support this kind of work. Why is it important, especially now uh, in this uh, day and age when media freedoms are under threat? You know, media freedoms are under threat, uh, but we're also seeing a perversion of media in certain parts of the world, like our own. Look at North America, look at the US, where it's not a coincidence, I would argue, Rachel, that that over the last 15 years, you know, you have a growth, a mushrooming and belief in, in crazy conspiracies. And at the same time, 2000 newspapers in the US have gone out of business, 2000 local newspapers. There are whole uh, regions in the US that are called newspaper deserts now because there's no local newspapers. And so news needs to be real. It needs to be relevant and people need to be engaged. It's a two way street in the sense of technology it also enables people to, to access the news and to be part of the news and to interact with, with uh, the journalists in ways that were unimaginable before. I mean, just look at this conference we're having now for all its technical challenges. This is something that would have been unimaginable uh, 10 years ago. And so this, uh, the ability for people to kind of tell their true stories and to, 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 to be present in media is super important. And our ability, as partner countries for, um, for uh, so many countries in Africa and around the world, and South Sudan, which is you know, the world's newest nation, uh, our ability to help them and not, in, in, in a way that's, that's, that's appropriate for neighbors and fellow citizens to help each other, right? We've got technical expertise, we have technology, we have experience, and it's about sharing that. It's about sharing tips the way you would share a tip with a new neighbor who moved into your neighborhood. And, and as a new nation, uh, building up the infrastructure with a long history, uh, you know, and, 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 a, and a, a very, uh, um, very shattering history with, with uh, the Republic of Sudan to the north, uh, the 40 years of conflict that led to this, uh, you know, it's, it's, in our, it's in our interest and it's the right thing to do to help uh, a country like South Sudan rebuild. I would also say that these things should not be episodic. You know, you go in, you do your bit, and then you leave. Uh, we know that doesn't work in life. Why should it work? It doesn't work in interpersonal relations. Why should it work in international relations? We're trying to help uh, 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 this new country build its capacity. And that is about an ongoing engagement. It's not about a one-shot deal or about coming in every couple of years. You know, whenever there's a gap, you, you know, we know this from, from our own lives. When there's a gap, you miss stuff. You, uh, when there's a gap, you lose the thread, you have to start over again. And it would be a shame if that were the case for South Sudan. So, I, I, you know, just finally, I wanna, I wanna uh, uh, Mustafa and Irene have spoken about the, um, the Canadian uh, um, ambassador uh, who I met with when I was there and contacted before and after. Uh, I, I mean, the work that we've done there as a country uh, is incredible. And I think it's such a perfect, kind of niche is the wrong word because it sounds too boutique-ish, but I think it's a perfect a position for a middle power like Canada, which is good on governments, which is good on openness and dialogue, to be able to, to offer these services to countries that are in need of them. So I, I hope that countries like ours and Canada in particular as a Canadian, someone who cares about our, our country and about our place in the world, I hope that we continue this engagement, that it, became, that it becomes kind of ongoing, it'll change as time goes on, but it would be a mistake to kind of say, okay, our work's done, next. That's not the way this stuff works. No, and uh, there's questions that are coming in from the, the audience, including one key question on when is JHR coming back to South Sudan? I ask this question every day. Uh, this is uh, from a, a journalist in, in South Sudan. Uh, and the answer is we're working on it. Uh, we're in discussions with uh, funders and we are hopeful that we will be able to return because as Irene has so adeptly laid out, despite the challenges of technology, uh, there is a lot of work 
uh, to do and a lot of work to build on that momentum that uh, this initial project has created. Uh, and, uh, and so we want to make sure that we capture that momentum. We are now at time, we're at 12.05 and I don't want to be uh, taking up too much more time. Uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to Peter, to Irene and to Mustafa for sharing your perspectives on how best to, uh, to, to learn from this experience in South Sudan. Uh, and I also want to make sure that we thank uh, certain key individuals. Uh, we're obviously grateful to the government of Canada who fulsomely supported JHR through this first four years of breakthrough programming in South Sudan. And we're uh, uh, in discussions on uh, hopefully a second phase. We're also grateful to Jenny Young and the UK government and the UK Consul General uh, team uh, for recognizing the importance of this work towards strengthening media freedoms and supporting it on this webinar. Uh, and in particular, the insight of creating an, this enabling environment in which media can start to thrive. And I use the word start because we uh, still have a long way to go uh, in places like South Sudan. There is a lot of work to do. Do not want to sugarcoat the challenge, uh, but we're at a really good ground level at this stage uh, to build up. Uh, I also want to make sure that we we thank and recognize uh, the leadership of first Grant McDonald, then Laura Bain, and then Siobolela Mandela, who uh, were respectively team leaders on this incredible program, and also uh, Juma John Stephen, who worked with both Laura and uh, and, and Siobolela to support them in their work. Mustafa, you were there throughout, including the crazy evacuation, uh, and happily you are now with us as a senior trainer on our program in Kenya. One of the questions that came in from the audience is, is JHR doing this work in other countries? Yes, I'm very happy to say we are. We're working on a four country major initiative with Global Affairs Canada, focusing on in particular prioritizing and amplifying the voices and perspectives of women and girls and women journalists, some of the work that Irene spoke about. As the African proverb goes, you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Uh, and we are working uh, in that spirit uh, to really focus in on uh, prioritizing uh, our work with gender in Kenya, DR Congo, uh, also in uh, with Syrian journalists working across uh, diaspora in Turkey, and now also in Tunisia. And we are working to fight the uh, scourge of misinformation and disinformation across 12 countries across Africa and the Middle East, uh, drawing off of uh, 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 curriculum materials created by Canadian expert uh, Craig Silverman, uh, First Draft, uh, and also Civics Canada. So we have got lots to do, um, uh, but there is no shortage of, uh, of, of this work. Uh, as Peter mentioned, we now have a situation where there is someone who is an avowed conspiracy theorist who has just been elected to uh, government in the US. Uh, we have a situation where we have two worlds in the US that don't seem to be able to talk to one another, let alone come to a consensus on facts. Uh, there is uh, such a challenge when we have broken information ecosystems and this work helps to address a lot of those problems. So. Thank you all for everyone. Thank you in particular, Jenny Young and your team at the UK Consul General. Have a wonderful day. And please, those who are able, tune into that Media Freedoms Conference, which is coming up November 16th, co-sponsored by the Government of Canada and the Government of Botswana. Thank you so much.